your host, Daddy Man. Hey there, Kitchen Newtons. It is your favorite Daddy Man in the kitchen because it's Friday night and that can only mean one thing. That's right, it is time once again for Mutant Cafe this week live. Welcome, welcome back to the kitchen. And as you can see, because I am technologically deficient, <laughs> we have a guest tonight. I was going to announce her later, but hey, let's announce her now. She is way too big of a personality to be held back by the Daddy Man. It is Miss Cresha. Fairchild, welcome, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Daddy Man. I'm hungry. I came hungry. <laughs> awesome. We like it when you're hungry. <laughs> so um, we will talk to Krisha in a minute, but let's get to the food part of it, which is part of the reason you're here, why you guys come back every week. It is the day after Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I want to let you guys know Everyone here at Mutant Cafe, myself and Hubs and Aunt Janet and Daddy Pammy, we're all so thankful for you guys. Thank you for watching the show for the past year and a half. It has been quite the adventure and you guys have made it. Um, everything that's good is all because you guys have been along for the ride. So thank you for that. And we are making today, as a tradition holds, two, two times, I guess that's still tradition, right? As tradition holds, we're taking those Thanksgiving leftovers and I'm showing you what to do. Um, instead of just having, you know, the turkey sandwich with a little bit of green beans on the side or whatever, that gets a little old after a week, right? So tonight we're making turkey Chimmy Changas, and I already have told Grisha, who actually is in Mexico right now, that these are the whitest old man Chimmy Changas you're ever going to have in the world. They are by no way authentic. I am not claiming that these have anything to do with the Chimmy Changa, other than we're going to wrap them in a tortilla. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, Grisha, we talked about it. Um, you are a vegetarian, which is awesome. Um, so no turkey. I'm, I'm, at, at the moment, I'm vegan, which is a step vegan. beyond, a step more lunacy than being vegetarian. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so no turkey for you. But I think all, uh, the rest of this, obviously, uh, could definitely be made vegan, I believe. Yeah, there's no dairy. There's no eggs. So, yeah, the rest of this definitely could be made vegan. And then maybe I'm not super familiar. But Krisha and I have already talked about this. I'm trying to become a little more vegan, a little more uh meat, uh, removing the meat from my diet is what I'm trying to say. Um, so I don't know, but maybe you could stick some tofu in here, I think, maybe some satan. I don't see why it wouldn't hold up with all this stuff kind of keeping it cooler um, as everything else heats up in the hot oil, maybe, could be. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll use yams instead of, instead of meat. How about that? Okay, that'll work. Or just completely leave it out and just load it up with veg. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Portobello's. Portobello's would be really good in chimichurri. Delicious. Yes, they would. I love a good marinated portobello. Nothing wrong with that. And roasted even better. A little balsamic. Even even less Mexican. <laughs> We're going to stick an Italian marinated portobello mushroom in the, in the chimichanga. All right. And the reason here tonight is because right after the show, um, we are going to jump over to Mutant Theater and we're going to watch Krisha um, from 2015. Uh, I have to say it is a movie that I saw in 2015 here at the Music Box Theater in Chicago. And it is one of those movies, I'm going to tweet it later when we start watching it, but it is a movie that will get into your psyche, get into the deep, dark crevices of whatever inside of you. It's not going to go away. It has not gone away for five years for me. Um, and that's a good thing. Uh, it definitely um, makes you think about some things that you may not have th thought about. And we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. But, you know, everyone has a story. And everyone, um, it, I have to say what it taught me is um, that we're so quick to judge without knowing what people have actually been through. And we bring to the table our baggage, put them on other people, and that causes us to not open up to other people. We could talk about this for probably about six hours. There's a lot going on in this movie. I think you guys will love it. We're going to talk about Grisha um, feels it's less horror, and um, I feel like it's definitely horror. We'll talk about that as well. So let's do the ingredients really quick, which is always what we do first, and then we're going to let 
Krisha ramble while I cook instead of me rambling like we normally do. <laughs> we're tired of hearing me ramble. I ramble. I'm a good rambler. I'm going to, I'm going to see, I'm losing my light here in Mexico. Uh, hang on a minute. I'm going to see if I can. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so we got two cups each of um, sweet potatoes. This is roasted sweet potato, and it's just mashed. A little salt and pepper, maybe a little bit of olive oil if it's a little thicker, and that's all you need there. We also have two cups of roasted Brussels sprouts. I do not want to hear from someone they don't like Brussels sprouts. You probably have never had them roasted. Um, you have a 425 oven, again, olive oil, salt and pepper, cut the little uh, hard ends at the bottom, put a little nick in them, and they're delicious. They're like 20 minutes. really good. Uh, roast turkey, if that's the route you're going, or marinated um, portobellos. I'm using white meat. You can shred or you can just cut into little slices. Three cups of the turkey gravy or um, maybe a marinade, the same marinade that you uh, used for the portobello maybe. Um, you need uh, two cups of the dressing. Do you know the difference between dressing and stuffing? In Louisiana, where I was born, stuffing is made with cornbread. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's very good. Stuffing is in the bird, dressing is out of the bird. Yep. I use them universal, to be honest, but, <laughs> but that's the difference. Um, and then two cups of cranberry sauce. And we have homemade cranberry sauce. I posted a video on Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't know. It feels like last month and it was only two days ago. But um, so that's all the ingredients you need. And the first thing you're going to do really quick is you're just going to take this turkey and you're, this gravy, by the way, is heated up. Uh, and you're just going to take your turkey and get it into that gravy and get it nice and submerged so it starts picking up all that yummy gravy. You don't want to put the gravy loose in the chimichanga because then it's going to start leaking out. You want the gravy kind of, you know, cuddling the turkey uh, so it kind of holds together. And I'm going to push this down and I'm going to put one right here, which is, you know, whatever, because I don't want it coming out that's done. <laughs> This is a fat separator, actually. That's why it's got a stem on it. <laughs> and I just realized I'm going to squirt this all over the screen and not be able to see Krisha. <laughs> yeah. well, I've looked worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then we've got um, eight 14-inch tortillas um, that I have put in a wet tea towel and thrown in the microwave for about 30 seconds so they're nice and bendy. This one's super raggedy. Um, let's not use the raggedy one, shall we? Okay. So let's talk about Krisha. Um, it's an interesting story, as I said, and the story gets even more interesting. Um, well, first, let's talk about you. Let's not talk. Let's start with you. The important part of the story. So I, I read a very interesting anecdote that um, a, a decade or so ago. I'm not going to reveal your age. <laughs> you have to be seventy. I'll be seventy in okay. December. <laughs> so <there you> go. <laughs> Krisha woke from a dream that kind of changed your life. Um, do you want to tell the story or do you want me to tell the story? Let you tell the story. Well, are you talking, if you're talking about the dream where, uh, where no, you, you do it because I, don't, I, I wake okay. up a lot of times. So, <laughs> so she woke up from a dream. Uh, at the time you were uh, Nancy Sinatra's personal assistant, which I find okay. Fascinating as a gay man, Nancy Sutton's like ah, dream job, Nancy Sutton's. That was much longer ago. That was in the uh, that would have been in the uh, early mid eighties. Okay. And I was living I was living in Los Angeles, and I woke from a dream. And I thought that it was real. I thought that I had really woken up. I got ready for work. I went to work in Nancy's house, which is where our one of our offices were. We had like two or three offices. And um, I get there, I, I go into the bathroom that's attached to my office and I uh, am washing my hands and I look up in the mirror and I'm like a 60 year old woman. Well, I was, you know, barely a 30 year old woman. And I woke up sitting bolt upright in, in bed in a cold sweat because yes, I had been traveling around in New York in limousines and having tea in the Waldorf with Frank Sinatra. Okay, yes, I had been living that life. I had been driving a, a Jaguar to drop the kids at school. I had been doing all those things. What I realized was, this isn't my life. This is their life. And if I stay here, one day I'm just going to die in this office right here and they'll just bury me and someone else will replace me. And I think that the dream was triggered by the fact that that had actually just happened to Mr. Sinatra. He'd had one of his longtime secretaries just literally 
<laughs> horrible. Just literally die in the traces. And I, I just was like, I was terrified. I was like, I got to find what my own life is again. I got to get out of this. Yes, this is cushy. Yes, this is wonderful. But and Nancy was the mensch of the universe. When I explained it to her, she gave me a huge bonus. And um, I, I moved to Seattle to, to get back into my acting career. And, and, and when I started being in films and things, I started getting fan letters from Nancy Sinatra. Oh. Every, every single thing that I do, she makes sure she sees and she sends me a fan letter. Now, how, what a what a mensch, huh? Good people, right? Good people. You don't find that very often in Hollywood, I would assume. Good people. Yeah. <laughs> so it changed your life. I mean, you you literally started focusing on yourself, which is such a good lesson for people to learn. You, you can focus on other people, and that's great, and it's good to be philanthropic, but if you're not taking care of yourself, you know, what are you really doing? And so that kind of sort of jump-started you into your career. You did a lot of voice acting. And then I would say you you were in some movies before Krisha, but Krisha was the one that first gave you that big Hollywood international kind of buzz, correct? Yeah, what what happened was that I got, I ran away from LA because it was like, you know, obviously if you've ever seen me, you know, I'm not I'm not built like an actress. I don't look like an actress. I don't talk like an actress. You know, I'm I'm a real person actor and that was not on point then that was not in trend at the time that i was in la and i just went into the i just disappeared into the paint you know i mean i was like n n nothing nobody even noticed you know i i had a theatrical ba background where it's like you know you could become anything on a stage and um, I, then suddenly in, people are putting me in front of cameras and I'm disappearing. So I left it. And when I got up to Seattle, I thought I was going to do theatrical and I discovered I had a gift for voiceover. So then I'm like, oh my God, I can build a studio in my house and I can do my job in my pajamas, you know? And then eventually I moved to Hawaii and then it was like, I can, I can do my, my job in a bikini in my closet. <laughs> And or naked, you know, if it was a really hot day, you know, and and I just didn't turn the cameras on on those days. Um, I supported myself for all those years. Well, why in the world would you go back to a career where they wanted you to lose 50 pounds and be younger and get your I, I had the when I was 30 something. OK, so, yeah, I got eyes. I got I got bags under my eyes. This is how I look when I was 30. I had a makeup artist tell me I needed to have my eyes done a little work on my eyes. I was just like, you know what? Fuck this shit. And so I found a way to support myself. I was in my, I was in the unions. I vested in the unions. I'm living a union pension right now. I mean, what a great way to say fuck you to the system that that what that is Hollywood. That is, I mean, I don't. There, there. It's wonderful that they do what they do, but it's just not my trip. You know, I never wanted to. So right. meanwhile, during all this, my nephew Trey would come to visit me and shit, and and um. He kind of discovered that I was living on a beach in Hawaii and working maybe four hours a week, you know, and, and he was like, hmm, yeah, <laughs> he'd, right. always, he'd always been creative. And so he started to think about directing and I was in his short films to help him out. And then when Krisha came along, he put me in that. I never, we never, I didn't, it was never expected to be in Cannes and to be in London Film Festival. And never, n not in five million years did we think that that movie was going to do that. But well, it did. And well deserved, by the way. I mean, a, a, an absolute, uh, just breathtaking performance. And you, you put yourself out there in ways that, you know, a lot of, I was, one of the questions I had written actually was I was going to ask you uh, what you felt the advantages were to kind of uh, becoming famous, I, I don't know if you like the word famous, but becoming well known um, at an older age, as opposed to, you know, we all know Hollywood and culture, 18, 19, WB, 20, 23, playing 16, you know, so uh, what, what was the advantage of maybe having that life experience under you and then kind of having to navigate Hollywood with the, you know, with the life experience that you had. It did, it, to me, it was the only way that that would ever have happened to me. It was the biggest advantage I could have had because by then I had learned 
This is who I am. This is what I know. This is what I can bring. You want it? You got it. You don't want it? Bye-bye. <laughs> I, I, I didn't care about money. I had developed a life where I had enough money to live the way I wanted to live. I traveled. I was that person who just, if I put a few dollars together, I'm off to Europe for, you know, carrying a bag on a train. You know, I, I'm, I'm a hippie. I, you know, I, so I, they, there was nothing they could dangle in front of me that would have made me want that life then. Yeah. And I certainly didn't want to have to change to do that life. So for me, I I got the benefit of showing up from out of nowhere. People, it, nobody knew I'd been a professional actress for 40 years when I did Cresha. They were like, oh my God, his aunt played the role. And she, God, you know, it's really, wow, non-actor, you know? And I was like, yeah, I'm glad you think I'm a non-actor. That's great. I was that good that you think I'm a non-actor. That's good. Yeah. As you get older, you either get, well, no. I was cripplingly insecure about my looks, about my gifts, about anything. When I was young, as I got older, I can just speak for myself. I got more and more and more secure of walking my walk, talking my talk, combining them both together in front of a camera or wherever you need me. And and um, I, I, it, it would never have happened to me if it had not happened now. When I was young, I would have I would have failed. I would have burned out. I would have I would have gotten into drugs. I would have drunk. I would have done something to sabotage it. And as, as an older person, I, I I just embrace it. I welcome it in, in a way that is like incredible <laughs> to me. Right? You appreciated it more. I mean, you knew you knew what was Absolutely. yeah. And I knew how to stand up for myself, Brian. I mean, you know, it's like you have, you run your own, and you have a regular job. And then in this, in this of your world, you run it. It's yours. It's your baby. Okay. Well, if somebody was coming in and trying to tell you how to change that or whatever, blah, 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 you know, you'd go, wait, I've been doing this. I, I think I, you know, the first time I actually stood up to a director and said, Okay, can I tell you the backstory on this character, which is the reason that I would rather do it this other way? And the director was, you know, like, like this. And I told him the backstory, and he's like listening, and he goes, That makes total sense. So when you did that other scene where you had that moment where you so and I went, Yeah, that that's that's her. Yeah. And and a lot of directors don't know how to think that act, the way actors think. They don't understand that an actor can absolutely always tell you what the character as written would do. The, the writer is the first person who knows what that character would do. The actor is the next. Sadly, the director comes in third on that. <laughs> comes in third, but has no clue that they're third, right? It's not in their head. <laughs> no, and, and I'm hoping none of them watched this and heard you say that. I mean, put, like, put the millions and millions of directors that watch this show, I think you're okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna pause really quick. We, we talked about this. I, you, grab your banana. Krisha has a banana. She needed to eat while I'm cooking. She, <laughs> she, can you all tell why I like Krisha so much? I mean, she kind of is a daddy man, right? <laughs> also, I'm, I'm drinking this. You do what you need. Uh, this is an actor secret. This is emergency. It's full oh, of no. electrolytes. Anytime you flag on camera, a little sip of this, you're good. <laughs> right on. There you go. Tip from Krisha. All right, so we're going to take um, about a quarter of a cup. I'm not going to use the quarter cup, but just so you can see it, this is kind of, these are the 12-inch um, tortillas. 14 would be better. 18 is even better if you can find it. If you got an 18, definitely use a little more than a quarter cup. I'm going to go a little under a quarter cup. First thing we're going to do is a sweet potato. Now, you're going to, you got the circle. You're going to build this close to you. Because what's going to happen is we're going to fold it under and then over and then we're going to roll it. And the last thing we want to happen is stuff to squish out because that's going to hit that oil. That's going to start burning and that's going to make your tortilla start burning. So go minimal. Make a lot of them with minimal stuff. Don't try to cram it all into one chimichanga. Life is not about one chimichanga, right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to go sweet potato first. And what that's going to do is that's going to kind of form a little barrier. So none of the gushy stuff is going to soak into that tortilla. It's making like, that's the mayo, let's say, of the chimichanga. Right, and we're also going to then next, we're going to hit some of this yummy turkey. 
and you know, pull some of the gravy off. Again, you don't want this sloppy, messy, gross, but you definitely want some of that gravy. You spent all that time making the delicious gravy. So some of that chicken, or excuse me, turkey, <clears throat> or chicken, would be good with chicken, or portobello mushroom. <laughs> now we're gonna take, again, some of this stuffing, and again, immaculate, clean hands. We've talked about that before. Grisha can verify, for a half an hour we chit-chatted. I didn't pick my nose or anything like that. He, he held his hands just like this, like, like, a, like a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I did, the whole time we talked. All right, and then we're gonna go just a little bit of powder. Problem with using your hands is you gotta clean them off. We're gonna go with this yummy, yummy cranberry sauce. Do you like cranberry sauce? Oh, it's one of my favorite foods on the planet. So good, tart. Mm. I make mine with homemade uh, or with squeezed oranges. Mine's super simple. Four cups of cranberry, one cup of sugar, uh, peel of an orange, the juice of an orange, two cinnamon sticks to uh, star anise, bring it up to a boil. 20 to 30 minutes, uh, take it down to a simmer, 20 and 30 minutes, done. I like the whole cranberries in there that are nice and soft and pop in your mouth. Me too, that's exactly how I like it. Uh, would, would honey be a sub or do you need the texture of the of the sugar? I think you could probably, yeah, you could do um, honey or you could do an agave if you wanted to. Yeah, I don't see why that would be any problem. It's honestly, it's just sweetening it up because the, the cranberry is, you know, super, super tart. So you're trying to just give it some sweetness. So yeah, anything you like, you could really, I mean, if you want to go crazy, use some maple syrup. <laughs> yeah. right. so we're going to go with some uh, <clears throat> shredded. I know I was... I know I was supposed to stay here, but I'm going to go make the maple syrup thing now. I'll be back in a in minutes. <laughs> There's, I have an um, awesome uh, bourbon uh, maple syrup milkshake that's uh, pretty fantastic. I mean, what's not good with maple syrup? Tell me. All right, so we're going to pull this over. I can already tell I almost filled this a little too much. So you're going to pull it over. I hope you all can see that. Let me get it kind of closer. And I got messy fingers. Hold on. All right. Now, don't worry, I'm going to do this several times while Krisha and I talk. And then you're going to pull this over to the side. And then you're just going to roll. All right. And bring it up. Grab a toothpick. And seal that sucker up. And that is it. Literally, that is one of the easiest <laughs> recipes I've ever done. We got some uh, canola oil going here. You can use peanut oil, vegetable oil, whatever your favorite oil is. I would not go coconut because um, it uh, takes a little while to uh, deep fry. We're not deep frying, excuse me. Uh, four inches of oil in the pot, and then we've got about 10 inches of no oil at the pot. Please don't overfill your pot. Put this in here, it's overfilled, it's gonna go onto your burner, it's gonna catch on fire, and then nobody's getting uh, you know, chimichangos tonight. Not so good. <laughs> so we're gonna go in for about four minutes, and then we're gonna flip it over. It should start bubbling immediately, which that one did. And you can't see it, I apologize. I need another camera, we're getting there. We Look up here tonight, y'all, just for Krisha. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the movie. Um, so Trey Schultz, uh, let me get the name right, I apologize. Trey. Trey Edward Schultz. Trey there Edward you go, Edward. I can remember the middle name. Uh, your nephew, which definitely works in Hollywood, right? Nothing like yeah. a little autism. <laughs> There's no problem, right? Everything you can see your advantage. Um, so I'm very curious. Okay, so this is a true, somewhat true, or based on a true family event. Um, and I'm going to let you take the reins here. We talked about this because I know this is, um, you know, a, it's a family story and it is um, a, a sad family story. So I want you to kind of, um, I guess what I'm curious about is how did he, and we're not going to spoil as well, y'all. Uh, I am going to show you the trailer. Lucretia and I talked about it. I don't want to spoil all the um, daddy man cherries out there who are watching it for the first time. Um, so how did he approach, how does one approach your family and say, hey, I'm going to put on the big screen this horrific thing that happened to our family? Um, how, how did he even approach, how did he start that conversation with y'all? Well, um, okay, so a little background. I, I'm sure that none of you have ever had alcoholism in your family. None of you. None of you have ever experienced being anywhere around an alcoholic or, an, or a person who takes drugs and hides it or sneaks 
but in my family, strangely enough, we had a generational trend of it. Um, my uh, my great grandfather on my mother's side, um, by the time I met him, he was living in a nursing home feeding imaginary chickens because he had run a still in the woods and drunk so much moonshine during his life that he was um, pickled in his brain compartment. Um, okay, so then my mother's father, who I love dearly, his name was Pee Wee. He worked in the all business, as they call it, in Orleans. And uh, he was the, the sweetest man. He loved Broderick Crawford's Highway Patrol. He would come home from work every day, sit in his lazy boy, and watch Highway Patrol, and he allowed, he was the guy who would allow me to put pin curls in his hair and paint his toenails and things like this when I was a little girl. What I didn't know was that that peculiar smell on his breath was because he was nipping Jack Daniels in the car uh, when I was 12 on my way to his funeral. He died of a stroke and emphysema, um, I put the armrest down on his big caddy. You know, they had the big armrest in the back seat. I put the armrest down and a bottle of Jack Daniels just like fell. And I'm like 12 years old and I look around and nobody else has seen it. And I just go like this and push it back up. And um, so my mother kind of came by her problem, honestly. And she was a sneak drinker most of her life and the best mother on the planet. And you will meet her in this movie. She's the old lady. The mother in the movie is played by my mother. Yep. And um, uh, we didn't know she was an alcoholic until we were in our 30s. So we're her three daughters are not actually full-scale adult children of alcoholics. We don't have all the stuff. If any of you do that and go to meetings, we have, we have but what we do have is the codependency, which I think is in any family that's had drugs or alcohol as an issue. Uh, the other family members spent half of their life tap dancing and uh, making excuses for the person and rationalizing and trying to make everything be okay. And, and, and I, 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 I was the peacemaker. I was the mediator. I was the tap, the chief tap dancer in my family around uh, anything that went wrong. All right. So Trey was a child growing up in this. His father was a, a full blown alcoholic and drug addict and, um, relapsed several times in his childhood. He had the pleasure when he was six of seeing his father try to try to slam his mother's head in a door. <laughs> and uh, so no child comes up through a family like that. Uh, we didn't get in touch with our damage until we were in our 30s and 40s. He was just admired in it. Okay, so his favorite cousin, uh, the first child in the family, her name was Nika. She was brilliant. She was invited to be in Mensa. You need to in interrupt and pull that out of the hot fire. No, I'm just looking it around. Keep going. Okay. Um, brilliant child. A lot of people get that in their first grandchild. We all adored her. Um, uh, when she was uh, 14, uh, she was backstage at a punk concert in Austin, Texas. And she and her friend, and they were good looking little goth chicks. And somebody gave them pa backstage passes and took them backstage into a room and shot, shot them up with uh, heroin. I'm sorry, this is, you know, this is so many years ago, but it's still, I, if you've experienced this, you know what it's like. All right, so suddenly that amazing child became a huge problem in this family because drugs were not something we'd ever dealt with. We knew how to deal with alcohol and hiding it. Drugs are a whole different thing. We were all college educated. We, you don't have a drug addict in your family. You know, it, it, it was, um, so Trey got to see his favorite cousin who had been a big, huge mentor to him just the rest of her life, just from the time she was 14 was a struggle. She got sober. She got back and forth, back and forth. She had three amazing children with three different men um, because she was so brilliant. Luckily, brilliant people were attracted to her and her children had the benefit of becoming remarkable human beings. But uh, at one point, uh, we had to remove them from her care. And... Um, um, I, I don't want to give a spoiler to the movie, so I'll just say that that plays into something that happens in the movie. And um, so she had been five years sober. She, was, she had been on a methadone program. And she'd been allowed to be around the children uh, with, with us for holidays, and she was doing remarkably well. And she had some kind of a setback, and she came home for Christmas one year 
and we didn't know that this had happened and she was using again and she was stealing and she was all of that 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 happens she was doing and uh the whole family we were there trying to keep one of her children who the the, the oldest boy trying to keep him safe when she was kind of going off the rails so trey observed all this there's a scene in the movie in which trey puts a character sitting where he was sitting when he was watching this the movie is not the things that happened the movie is around the kinds of things that happened and the way people feel when they happen when someone you love is making this happen at a holiday particularly so um five weeks after that she had passed off an overdose and trey locked himself into a room and wrote a movie and he came came out of the room and he said to us i wrote a movie it's kind of about Gigi, grandma great grandma and nika it's kind of about them it's kind of not but um i want to make it and he looked at me and he goes and I, I want you to play her and i'm like i'm the middle child capricorn i'm the one who takes two sips of wine and i'm dancing on a table i i can't I don't think I don't and I, I I was really I mean I sound very cocksure when I talk about myself now but at this time the thought of playing the two two of the women I had loved the most in my entire life and lost them both to this it scared me and then everyone in the family took a beat and said if we can help one family one family understand they're not alone in this yes and we all signed up and we we're all in it and, right. uh, <laughs> and i love that i mean you were all there it had to have helped to have all of you actually on set playing yourselves or different characters but to support each other and that had to have i mean i can only i can't imagine this movie being made if it were complete strangers and you trying to retell the story it had to have helped having the family be the cast it, it a absolutely did and we were we were making it in trey's famil family house my sister robin who is his mother um uh, and, and her husband david opened the house to to everyone um robin and i are, are she's much younger than i am and we're i was kind of like a substitute mother to her when she was young and we we're like soulmates i mean everybody meets their soulmate i I didn't get lucky in the in the life partner being my soulmate. I've had I'm a serial monogamist, um, but uh, I got my my soulmate and my sister, my little sister, and um, her husband knew what it was going to take for the, us to do this, and um, he he went to visit his mother so that Robin and I could share a, a room together. Uh, while we were shooting it and uh i got there i got to the shoot a week early and and changed all the beds and 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 fixed all the linen and everything for everybody who was going to be there every morning i would get up first and make coffee for the crew that we we all made meals together we bought a panini maker i i the biggest <laughs> tip i can ever give you low low budget indie get a panini maker <laughs> you know i went to I went to Costco the, the two days before I started this movie. I went to Costco and bought like six hundred dollars worth of things, and and that's what everybody ate. We made the film in nine days, which wow. is yeah. crazy, and we did. And um, the it was long longer for me, longer 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 than nine shooting days for me, and Trey the audio guy and the camera guy because after the shooting day was done we went and did all my personal private one-on-one -on -one scenes we shot those until the wee hours of the morning so it, it 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 was always a family affair it was always gonna be that we all gave a thousand percent and you can't get luckier than that when when you're making your first feature film and then, amazing and to go through the whole process with the family had to have been fun you know you weren't with uh co-workers you were with your family that had to have and um and and healing occurred through the process i assume yeah. you know um yes uh he, the, the healing that it's interesting 
by the time we were shooting it, it was a year after um, after she had passed. So some healing had already begun, but not for her mother, my older sister, who is in the film. Um, she's the woman who has the two uh, young sons and the daughter that has the baby. Okay, that's that that's that's her, and. Um, her husband is the man who does the scene with me outside when we're smoking. I, I, he is amazing. I love him so much. <laughs> you know what? Bill Wise is, he, if, the fact that he is not an Academy Award winning actor, I don't know what happened on that path, but he's brilliant and he's wonderful in it. And Trey basically went to meet him in Austin. He'd heard about it and he said, I don't have this guy scripted. I have him in my head. I know kind of, I can tell you who he is. You do improv, will you bring his words? And Bill said, yes. There are there are lines that he added to that film that Trey could have spent five months seeking the right words for, and, and Bill Wise brought them. And uh, yeah, so anyway, um, uh-oh, where was I? Why, why were we talking about that? <laughs> The scene outside, I don't know where, I mean, he's an amazing, I, I, here's some, we, we talked beforehand, Krisha and I have talked for several weeks setting this up, but one of the first things Krisha said to me was, she doesn't consider this necessarily to be a horror movie. Now, I know when we were talking um, right before the show started, I think that's because Krisha, like a lot of, I think, the, the general populace who are non-horror people, you know, you, when you think horror, you think slashers, you think Jason with his big machete. There are lots of different kinds of horror. I have to say the scene you're talking about to me was one of the most horrific because this guy calls you out. I mean, he calls, he's the one person in that family that does not have a problem. He pulls you aside, which is, you know, polite, but he does definitely call you out. And the tension in this scene, you can see it on your face. You can see it in your body language. You know he's calling you out and you are waiting. And going to be the moment and, who is going to explode that, who is and that scene is completely improvised trey would be the first person to tell you that he put us in that place and he trusted us and he did two versions of it and the direction on one version again i'm being careful what i say the direction on one version is you guys are old drinking buddies the direction the second time we did it was you guys are old enemies and then he Whoa. ended I mean, what's he edited the, the two oh, scenes, oh, right. the two takes together. He used pieces from both of them in the and in, in the film, which is which is you know brilliant. And um, yes. hand, right? I mean, the drinking buddies sometimes are the old. <laughs> I can see you could tell there was a history there. You could tell there were evenings that got a little out of control. That maybe you know maybe some things did happen. You could tell in that scene. There are volumes spoken in the unspoken parts of that scene for sure. Yes. And and the, the echoes later in the film when when there are actions that happen and his responses to those actions, his public responses to those actions are uh, also very telling that he is still a closeted alcoholic. And oh, she it, she's trying to be straight. Watch it with that in mind. Watch it with okay. that in mind. All right, you know what I'm going to do real quick? We got one more uh, chimichanga in there. We did pull one out. You can see it here, and I will cut that. Just so you know, rest this for a minute or two. Don't cut into this. It's going to squirt gravy and things, hot, hot gravy and things out on you. you room temperature is fine. You don't need this scalding hot. So I'm going to show the trailer really quick, um, and then we'll be back, and we will talk about – I'd like to talk about Channel Zero. I know we are – watching Krisha next, but I definitely want to talk about Channel Zero because you were with the amazingly gorgeous at every age, Rutgers Howard. <laughs> so let's talk about that. So let's see the trailer really quick and then we'll be right back. Where have you been? What have you been doing? I have tried to become a better human being. <laughs> a lot you missed. Oh. You've got a lot of fixing to do. Are you mad at me? Mm -hmm. For sure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
But I just want to be close to you and make up for lost time. I have stayed away while I was healing myself. You are a lever. You are heartbreak incarnate. If you think you can just pop in and pop out of people's lives like this, you are malinformed. You don't know who I am. You don't know anything about what I'm here trying to do. What's going on with you? Which I totally hate, Spina. I'm not going back. Grisha, no. I've earned a right Want to be you? at this table. Did you lie to me? You Grisha. look at me and tell me you love me. <laughs> look over there. Mom, there's Grisha. Your daughter. Her name is Grisha. Her yeah. name is Grisha. That's your daughter. That's Kreisha. Oh, amazing. Such a good trailer. I cannot wait for you guys to see this movie. It's so good. <laughs> Whoa. So, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. There, there's a couple million things I want to ask you from that trailer, but the one thing I'm going to ask you, and I don't want you to tell me, and I'm not going to spoil, but the finger... Like who, where, how did that come about? <laughs> like it's so unsettling and it's yeah. never explained. Okay, in May, May 5th, I was in uh, I was in Mexico in my new life that I thought I had retired, didn't know I was gonna be making movies. Um, I have a dog that is a pit bull mix. She's bossy, but not uh, vicious or ferocious unless she's attacked by another dog. A dog was on our property, came up on her porch with the woman. Uh, my dog was on a tie out. She was tied up. The dog came and attacked her. My dog went after the dog. The leash wrapped around the 80 year old lady's legs and she was pulled to the ground under the dog fight. I know not to reach my hands into a dog fight. I'm left-handed. I grabbed my dog, the stronger, bigger dog with my left hand. I had her like this. I reached for the other dog. The other dog, who was a terrier mix, bit me on, oh. on the finger. <laughs> I ignored it for a few days and just took care of it. Um, and then by the time I went to the emergency room, they you know called a doctor. I, we spent a month trying to save it. Yeah, the infection had gone into the tendons and uh, the bone. And finally, they told me yeah, the infection is headed this way. Now, do you want to keep your hand or do you want to wait and see? And um, so I, I had them amputate it. It looks very different than it looks in the film because in the film, it had only happened two months. Okay. And um, Trey called me after hearing that my finger had been amputated and said, oh my God, I'm really sorry that happened. And um, you think you're gonna be okay like um, to shoot the movie in two months? Uh, exactly, exactly two months. I got everything all together and all the money and everything. I just started, I started sobbing. I was like, you never had a piece of your body cut off. I don't know if you understand. <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I, I can't go to those places and then come back. I don't think, you know, I, I got a little dramatic and I basically told him, you know, I, 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 I don't think I can. And there was a tiny silence and he said, okay, then I, 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 that, I totally understand. I'm going to, I'm going to cancel everything and we'll do it when you're ready. And we hung up the phone and it took me like two minutes to realize what I was doing by sabotaging his first feature he was going to lose all of his deposits. He was going to, and I just called him back and said, we're on. So um, I said, what are we going to do in the movie? How do you want to explain it? And he said, she's been gone for 10 years. What if she doesn't talk about it? And I thought, wow, 
Yeah. Like what, what does that say about alienation in a family? Yeah. Somebody shows up with a limb missing and you don't discuss it. Yeah, it's never discussed. It's definitely, I mean, there are some deliberate camera shots of, you know, the finger right there and you're waiting and you're waiting. And that's fascinating. I did, it did not even occur to me that not a single person even mentions it once. Interesting. Nope. And, and, there, and, and, okay. So again, this is not giving away too much in the scene that they have together that you saw in the trailer, she and the son, the, the, the boy on the couch, he's yeah. wearing a brace. He's wearing a brace on his knee, the whole movie. And nobody oh, ever talked about that either. Interesting. I mean, how typical is that? We don't talk, right? We talk, but we don't talk. We talk yeah. about nothing <laughs> really much. That's Thanksgiving, right? We get together and talk about absolutely nothing. Holiday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. So Channel Zero, um, great, great sci-fi series. Um, you were in season three, I believe, The Butcher. Uh, to me, craziest season. I, I still don't know that I completely understand what was going on <laughs> that season. But you had the best character just ready to dive in and the crazy alien, whatever stuff going on. And there you were ready for battle. And I love it from minute one. <laughs> uh, uh, me too. Uh, okay. That's a good story too, because um, um, Nick and, Ka and Tosca who wrote it uh, was on Hannibal. He was like one of the, I think he, I don't know. He was, he was the writer and EP on our show and on Hannibal. I think he was the head writer. I'm not certain. Um, he saw Cresha in the very first screening at South by Southwest. We went to South by Southwest. Nobody knew who we were. We didn't have a publicist. We didn't have anything. We won after two screenings, we won the grand prize and everybody in the theater is like, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of this movie? All the other filmmakers, they're there and they're like, this film came from out of nowhere and you just gave it the grand prize. And we all, or the whole family, uh, and all the actors, and we all get up on the stage and we're all like, oh, oh, oh. like, you know, like total Joe Blow amateurs, because that's how we are, that we, that's who we are, we're real. And we, and everybody was, oh, very, very kind of snooty a little bit, you know? And we, then a couple of days later, we won the audience award also, which has only happened like a couple of times. Wow. When Nick Costco was at the first screening. He fell in love with the possibility of, of what I could be in horror. Of what, what he saw immediately, the horror in that film before anybody had even written about it, and um, he contacted me and said, "I'm going to write something for you." And he, he, the first, oh wait, I can't, I have to be careful about this. Okay, there was a, another thing that he had written that he had me in mind for, and uh, he couldn't get me through uh, the studio heads. They were like, she doesn't have a big enough name. She's a, she's a nobody, you know, and they hired a, a name. So he got to me, he got back to me, he said, this next time, I'm going to write a character that only you could do. And I'm going to make sure they've seen Cresha before I pitch you. And he did, and they did, and they let him. And I got to chase Rutger fucking Howard down a tunnel with a gun and <laughs> shoot at him as a 60 fucking something year old obese woman. Yes. <laughs> it's great. I mean, you're great in it. And horror, you know, while everyone concentrates on the final girl, the, the innocent, um, you know, ingenue, who, that what we love about horror is when the final girl becomes the, self-determined to say you know self-aware and that's where your character was that's what made that character so great is right out of the bat you were self-aware you knew who you were you knew what you were capable of and you took like you said that gun and you took that situation by the hand and you you ended it up like it, because of you like that that story ended the way it did i love it i i loved it too i i, I just was so i was so moved it was also the the first and only money job I've ever had in my life. So yeah. I have a nest egg now from doing a TV series. All the other work that I've done, you know, awards and shit like that, my nest egg came from Nick and Tosca's loyalty to me as a friend to write a role for me that he knew they couldn't 
turn me down for. And, and okay, and I'm going to tell you something that very few people know. I'm giving you an inside track. Ooh. That was a two month shoot in Canada. The last three weeks of that shoot, I had two broken feet. Really? Because there's I not had, a moving in that movie. Or I'm, I, excuse me. We had just finished the last scene where I was hauling ass up a, up a hill, carrying a child. We, we, had we had finished all the tunnel action. We had finished everything in which I had to move ass. And I had already established her having a walking stick, a cane, a staff, right. just because I liked the idea of it. And once I was in a wheelchair, <laughs> I would get up out of my wheelchair and act and then back down in my wheelchair. I was in space boots. So, so you couldn't see my feet uh, through half the stuff. Brandon, who played my sidekick, you know, my buddy, the two the, the we we're, we still say we need a, a buddy movie. Um, the deputy guy, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Great. He, in the, in the scene where I'm carrying him on my back, I have two broken feet. He is holding me up. While we were moving. In, and scenes where I appear to be after I have sewn his neck together and and he's like bleeding to death in every scene, he's supporting me because I can't stand up on assistant. Oh, oh my God. What a right? nobody knows it. Everything you see that is in Louise's house from the moment you are in her house, every piece of that. I had two broken feet while we were doing it. My own stupid fault. I was in a restaurant on my day off. I just had avocado toast and a latte. I was in heaven. I'm headed out the door. There's a, a, a short staircase and a door into blinding sunrise, a sun, uh, a sun. And I'm coming in from out of the dark and somebody opens the doors and I missed a step and, and went down and broke bones in both feet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was you. There was no one else to play that role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's we turn were mostly two. Want to see what this looks like on the inside? You've been waiting so long. Yeah. yeah serrated knife. We've talked about the serrated knife. Ah! Cut this open. I don't like knives. Don't grab it. <laughs> and there we go. There is your. Let me see if I can. Chimmy Chang. Oh. Yep, get that on a plate. <laughs> it is good, man. Give it a little more gravy if you want. I don't know how I got two spoons in here, but I do. Give that some gravy oh. because, hello, more gravy is always good. The answer is always yes, more gravy, right? <laughs> get that toothpick out of there so we're not poking anybody. Maybe a little bit more cranberry since Kreisha likes it and this is hers. Yes, yes. There we go. That is your leftover Thanksgiving turkey chimichanga. Thank I mean, you. <laughs> oh, daddy man, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> Mexico is too far. You know, if, I was, if I was closer, it was, Mexico is too far. You know, you couldn't well, get next it. In Chicago. Krisha and I talked about it. Krisha spent some time in Chicago. She's got the same love I have for Chicago. So I promise you, once this nonsense that we're going through is over and you're back in Chicago, I will make you this and anything else you ask for. You just, you have carte blanche. Yum. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so sorry we're out of time. I wish I could talk to you for another three hours. I think everyone wishes we could talk to you. Um, it is Friday Night Frights, as you um, probably have been inundated with over the past two weeks. It's Friday Night Frights. We are watching the movie next at uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time. And tonight we are uh, watching it in the Coast Me program. I can never say that word. So y'all follow our tweets. That'll take you to the room. We decided since it is Thanksgiving holiday, we wanted to pull everybody a little closer. It's got a screen. It's got a chat room down the side. That way... It's a personal topic and it's a hard movie to watch and we thought it'd be easier if we could watch it with us all a little bit closer instead of getting out there in the Twitter world and having people say nonsense, not knowing what we're talking about. So we're keeping it nice and close for Krisha. 
Um, thank you so much, man. Thank you for the movie. Thank you for being here. And thank you for spending the time talking. You, you're fabulous. Again, I wish I could talk to you for like three or four hours. Hurry up, make another movie, another horror movie. I want to see you. I want to see you maybe as the like killer. Why don't we see that once? Look at that. Amen. From your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> <laughs> I love that gleam you got in your eye. <laughs> she knows she has it in her, folks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have it in us, right? A little bit. But thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Krisha, so much for being here. You are an amazing guest. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. We are going to be back again next week. Krisha is well aware who Joe Bob Briggs is. We are going to be making uh, Darcy the male girl and Joe Bob Briggs the cowboy um, uh, chocolate bark. We're making chocolate bark for Darcy, and it's going to be vegan uh, with uh, lots of awesome nuts and berries and dried coconut. And for the cowboy, we are taking uh, some peppered beef jerky and some smokehouse almonds and we're, we're making bark. Uh, it's a nice Christmas treat that you can make next week and have it ready for the following week, which is the Joe Bob Saves Christmas special. So I will see you guys next week, exact same place, exact same time. I'll see you in about six minutes in the Kosumi room where we are going to watch 2015. You just watched the trailer. Krisha, starring the magnificent Krisha Fairchild. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Enjoy the film. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll hit that outro, and I will talk to you on the other side. Thanks, guys.